Okay, today is, let's see, is February the 25th, 2021, and we actually have weather that we can handle. We sure thank the Lord for it, too. So let's prepare ourselves in our usual fashion by having a few moments of silent prayer, the option of naming privately to God the Father, which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for another day of your grace, the opportunity to be here with members of the royal family to obey your command to grow in grace and knowledge. We thank you for the grace system of perception whereby we can understand the whole realm of doctrine. We thank you for this opportunity to do that. We pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to begin tonight. Here it is up here. I'll put it on the board. <clears throat> Excuse me. We ended last time with just looking at Romans chapter 2, verse 7, which is where we're going to continue tonight. And I can assure you we'll, we will not be finished with this by the end of tonight. But we'll give it a shot. Romans chapter 2, verse 7 in the New American Standard Version says, to those who by perseverance and doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Then we have in the ESV, Romans chapter 2, verse 7, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. I have another one that we'll get to in just a moment, which is the New King James Version, and it is different from both of these. The fact that it has to do with the different ways that it is translated is only part of the issues that you have to deal with with this particular verse. We've been dealing with good works and how they pertain to a Christian's life, indeed in anybody's life. And we are addressing one of the oldest, probably the oldest issue that has been associated with the Bible. And that is where do good works, where do they take a person? Can they take him all the way to heaven? Or are they really not even germane to heaven? We'll get into that as we continue. This is Lesson 65. Romans chapter 2, verse 7 through 10. Now, these are associated with one another, verses 7 through 10. You'll see that as we get to the other verses, but right now we're nailing down verse 7. Romans chapter 2, verse 7 through 10 distinguishes between two kinds of people, those who do good and those who do evil. Some believe these verses differenti dif differentiates between believers and unbelievers. They think that the believers are the ones who persevere in doing good works as they seek glory, honor, immortality, and eternal life. And unbelievers are self-seeking, disobedient, unrighteous, evildoers. If you took a poll and just presented Romans chapter 2, verse 7 through 10, most people would agree with that because most people think that believers are better than unbelievers in their behavior. And that may be true to a large extent, but it certainly is not true with everyone and not with anyone all the time. The problem is sometimes believers behave like unbelievers and sometimes unbelievers behave like believers. There are legalistic unbelievers who can pass as believers, and there are hell-raising believers who appear to be unbelievers. In fact, I wrote a book back there, it's still in our library, that it's a question, can you tell if a person is saved by their behavior? And most people, without reading the book, would say, well, yes, when you're saved, 
You might sin, but very rare, and they're just minor sins. That's what a lot of people think. But we know better because we're believers and we know ourselves. And not even counting other people. It's easier to judge other people. We don't like to judge ourselves, but even with ourselves, we know that sometimes we act just like unbelievers. Now let me see where this came from. This is a pretty long quote here. It's from Arthur L. Farstad. We believe in good works, and it came from the Journal of Grace Evangelical Society, Volume 2 and Number 2, pages 8 and 9. And this speaks to what I've just said, so let's look at it. Many of the things encouraged in our previous discussion have been and are practiced by people who are clearly not believers in the biblical sense or even professing Christians at all. So this is, uh, uh, of course, continuing where he was. Here's his point. Jews, Muslims, and even humanists can do many nice things. The same outward act can be done by a believer and an unbeliever, yet only one deed will be counted as a good work in God's eyes because it springs from his spirit. Now we know what he's talking about here. Jews, Muslims, humanists, all unbelievers. They can do nice things, and what they do on the outside would be what Christians are supposed to do on the outside. I'm talking about by their, by their behavior. But one is counted as a good work in God's eyes, and one is not. And the difference is one is, according to this, it springs from his spirit. This is referring to the Holy Spirit. So the only kind of work that God will accept is the kind that he does through the Holy Spirit. And actually, when it comes to that kind of good, which we call divine good, and it's right to call it divine good because it's the divine, it's the Holy Spirit that is doing the work through us. We're just a vessel that he uses to do the good works. Because God is not impressed in the slightest of the best thing we could ever do. We could give our life for others. I, th I have two books at home that have to do with the records of the Medal of Honor winners. And some it's pretty often in their reading of their deeds that they did, you have one soldier where he will throw himself on a hand grenade to save the others. He gave his life to save the others in a moment's time. So that is a wonderful thing. And we would, enough to give him the highest award in our country for honor and, and courage. But it might not mean a thing to God as far as him being impressed with it. It's a good thing, but it might be an unbeliever. And so, the only thing that God is impressed with with regards to our works is what he's doing through us. And this, this pretty well speaks to it. Look at this sentence again. The same outward act that can be done by a believer and an unbeliever. Unbelievers can do the same good things that we do. Yet only one deed will be counted as good work in God's eyes because it springs from his spirit. Now, Believers can do good things also. But if it's not, as according to this says, if it doesn't spring from the Spirit, from the Holy Spirit, all it is is human good. God is not impressed with human good. In fact, human good, when people try to be accepted by him from their own human good, is repugnant to him. Not only is it not helpful, it's harmful. What Shakespeare calls the milk of human kindness is an, um, an observable trait. Sometimes unbelievers are more active in doing nice deeds than Christians, and people judge accordingly. And I would say this isn't something that's rare. It happens all the time. Sometimes I wonder how you get some unbelievers and they... they Join a club, it's a club of maybe bird watchers. 
and let's start for the sake of argument, they're all unbelievers. And they get along just phenomenally. There's no backbiting, there's no uh, gossip, there's no any of those things. And then you get a church group together uh, that's going to have some function and they're at each other's throats. And so this is showing that when it comes to how people act, the unbelievers can be even more, well, this it goes on to say, however, the comparison should not be between the best that a refined or religious believer can do versus a lazy, immature, or carnal believer is doing. So what he's saying is, the unbelievers can do things that are observable. And sometimes they're more active in doing nice things than Christians are. Now here's, we're getting to a good point here. However, the comparison should not be between the best that a refined or religious unbeliever can do versus a lazy, immature, or carnal believer is doing. But what would be the difference in the same person before and after salvation and sanctification? In other words, it's not that we compare an unbeliever work and a believer's work. That's not even a fair comparison to begin with. But we're interested in the believers and the right way to judge this is the difference in the same person before and after sanctification or salvation. This is hard to gauge, but many Christians struggling with a bad temper, lust, a sharp tongue, or selfishness are quick to point out how completely hopeless they were before their con uh, conversion. Some people by nature seem endowed with the milk of human kindness and actually enjoy helping others, often with mixed motives, however. But when a basically selfish person does good works for Christ's sake, he is, quote, doing what comes supernaturally. So do you get it? That was a lot in this, in this quote here. But it is essentially saying that any believer can strut around and compare himself with other people, many of them maybe being unbelievers, and that's not even a fair fight. It's, it's, it's a judgment that is not, not just. And we shouldn't compare ourselves with other believers either. You've heard me say more than one time, if we're going to judge ourselves, the standard should be Christ. How do we stand up to Christ? That should be our mode of judgment. And I've known people and probably you've known people that seem to be just naturally nice and patient and kind. By the way, I, I don't have to tell you, I'm not one of those people. I, I tried as hard as I could. All I could do is be a hypocrite. I'm not a mean person. Well, I don't know. We're not going to talk about me because it doesn't, it doesn't even matter. But my point is, that some people can be good and thoughtful and kind, and they don't even have to make an effort. You know those kind of, kind of people. And then there are others who, according to this, it says they are a basically selfish person, does good works for Christ's sake. He is doing what comes supernaturally. Some people are argumentative and some are not. Would you agree to that? Some are more forgiving than others. And I would guess, since all I can do is guess, if you have a patient, loving, thoughtful, kind person, it's easier for them to do good works. But for some that you look at, and you might even question they're just a professing uh, believer, they can't be that ornery and be a believer. Well, maybe they are. Maybe you're looking at a version of this person after he was saved, and he's really done a pretty good job in behaving better than he did before. Now, what would give a believer an incentive to do that? Well, you might say, well, because you want to please Christ. Well, that's true. And you, he, you would want him, he would want to 
have rewards and decorations. Certainly in, in eternity, that, that would be another one. But most of the time, for some people, it's the divine discipline. They're behaving better than they did before because they know that if they acted like they did before they were saved, the wrath of God would come down on them and they got a taste of that and they don't want it anymore. So, but when a basically selfish person does not, does good works for Christ's sake, see the motivation is so important. There can be good, good people are the kind that are naturally kind and patient and all that. Um, and they're doing uh, good works. It doesn't count if they, even if they're a believer and they're doing that, but they're doing it from the wrong motive, it's still human good. Not only do we have to be filled with the, well, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to be doing it with the right motive. But nobody, no believer is filled with the Holy Spirit all the time. So, I think that this tells us that when it comes to believers and unbelievers, both of us are going to have to strive to do good works because it's not our nature. And as hard as an unbeliever can strive to be good, and maybe he is better than a believer, he still cannot be acceptable to God by his works because they are abhorrent to God if you try to be accountable to, or be accepted to him by that. Romans chapter 2, verse 7 through 10 seems to emphasize the fact that God shows no partiality when it comes to judging the works of all people, whether they are believers or unbelievers. So what I'm saying when we get into verse 7 as we are, and we go through to verse 8, 9, and 10, don't think in terms of, well, this person is a believer and this was a, is an unbeliever. I think this is generic. I think it's saying, <coughs> excuse me, that God holds everybody accountable. They are all judged by the same measure. And it's not about whether you're a believer or unbeliever. Because God holds us all accountable, doesn't he? The believer for sure and the unbeliever as well. The believer has an edge up because he has the Holy Spirit and he can do things that are acceptable to God. The only thing an unbeliever can do that is acceptable to God is to believe the gospel. And then he has the Holy Spirit and then he can produce divine good. The issue here is not salvation. So don't, be, don't think that these verses have to do with anything that is salvific. And that's where so many people, in fact, most of the resources that I use in order to exegete this verse think that way. They think it's all salvific. But it's not. And you'll see that as we go through. So the issue here is not salvation. It is how God evaluates all, all people, believers and unbelievers. On the basis of truth, works, and light, the point he is making here is that God shows no partiality or favoritism when he judges the human race. Some wonder why God does, does not judge the really wicked. Just like, you know, who's the first one that pops into your mind when you think of the most wicked person ever? Hitler, yeah. Hitler's number one, then maybe Mussolini or maybe Stalin or, you know, and they wonder why, I, I would throw in there, what's his name? Um, the one that's trying to destroy America. He's got billions and billions. Yeah, George Soros. I would, I would put him in that category. So they wonder why God does not judge the really wicked Gentiles of the world. His response is that those who themselves are going to be judged ought not to be judging others. Isn't that a good point? And that just pulls the rug under, out from under us from judging anybody, doesn't it? Because we all are going to be judged. We leave the judging to Jesus Christ. God the Father left all judgment up to Jesus Christ. Shouldn't we do the same? 
especially since we are going to be judged. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 9. I, get, I went here first because it's so simple. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. And that's what we're talking about is God's judgment. Is the, is the standard for believers any different than unbelievers when it comes to sowing and reaping? No. The whole human race falls under this. Verse 8. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall reap the, shall reap from the Spirit, or excuse me, from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now I have that in red and I'll deal with it in just a minute. Obviously he's talking about a, be, a believer in this portion, but the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. That has to be a believer because unbelievers don't have a spirit, do they? They're spiritually dead. Verse 9. And let us not lose heart in doing good. And that's easy to do. Because you can do good for others and they don't even thank you for it. Nobody notices. You think it's just, why did I go way out of my way? They didn't thank me. But it says, and let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. Just keep on making the meals and taking them to people who are sick. Go and visit them. Visit people in prison. Uh, encourage and exhort people. This is all things that we need to do. And that's sowing. And again, notice it says, but the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. We'll get into, into eternal life in a moment. But if you do that same thing and you are not sowing from the Spirit, what is it? It's human good. I mean, it, you can't say that human good is bad. Human good isn't bad. Human good, though, is worthless according to God. He's not impressed. He doesn't, it's not in his realm. Okay, so you see here I have reap eternal life. It's in the reverse. Souls to the Spirit shall reap from the Spirit, shall reap the Spirit. Excuse me, I don't know why I want to keep saying reap first. It seems like the normal way of saying it, reaping from the Spirit. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now here's reap eternal life. It is important to note that reap means to receive something based on one's actions, whether those actions are good or bad. And the outcome is going to determine whether it was good or bad, but when you reap, it means you receive something for based on what you've done. The eternal life that is received from God as a gift on the basis of faith in Christ is based on faith. So what I'm saying is, when we're talking about things that you do and you're going to be rewarded or punished for them, you're reaping and sowing, but eternal life that is received from God as a gift on the basis of faith in Christ is based on faith. That's a big difference. And most of the people in this world that are really, I'll just say religions, will take the former rather than the latter, or they'll take the former and try to apply it to the latter. We do, in an experiential way, reap what we sow, <clears throat> excuse me, for what we do. Whether you're a believer or unbeliever, no matter what, you're going to reap what you sow by what you've done. But when it comes to receiving the gift of eternal life from faith alone in Christ, it is based on faith. 2 Timothy 4.14. Now, the reason I threw this in here because it looks like it shows that uh, <clears throat> God also is going to judge unbelievers. I'm not saying at the great white throne. I'm talking about in their own lives. Here we have 2 Timothy 4.14. Alexander the coppersmith, and it appears to be an unbeliever. I did a little research on that. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
did much harm. This is, of course, Paul writing 2 Timothy. May the Lord repay him according to his works. So you have an unbeliever here that is also going to be repaid according to his works. And repayment can be that, that, the, the, that a boy, the, it can be something good, or you can be repaid with God's wrath. What does it depend on? It depends on your works, whether they are good works, whether they're uh, evil things that you've done. Now, here's the one that I told you. I said we were going to get to the New American Standard Version, and then we're going to go to the King James Version. Romans chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. I put these two together because they, they have to go together and they need to get the whole context. Romans chapter 2, verse 6 says, Who will render to every man according to his deeds. Now the word render there is a future active indicative. What that means is he's going to get what he deserves. He's going to get what God is going to render, but it's in the future Active voice, God's the one that's going to render it. Indicative mood means it's not just a potential, it's going to happen. So, who, referring to God, will render to who? Every man, believer or unbeliever, according to his deeds, according to his works. Now, verse 7. To those who by perseverance in good work... Get your Bible out. I want you to follow this in your Bible because you're going to see it's not exactly according to your Bible and I'm going to explain to you why. Does all, everybody here have a, a New American Standard Version? What do you have? New King James? Oh, you do? Okay. Then you'll see how what I've got on the board is a little different. Romans chapter 2, verse 7. To those who by perseverance in good work seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. Do you notice up here I have scratched out the word doing? Do you see that? And the reason I do that is because doing is a participle. It's a verbal. It's, it's related to a verb. But this is an adjective that's there. And the adjective is good. And then we have works. Now, work. Yours, doesn't yours say, uh, does yours say work or works? What does it have? Okay, that's what happens. See, they, let me explain what this is. The word doing is agathos, which means good. And then you have the work, which is ergon. So, well, I don't know where they got the idea to put a verbal here. <clears throat> when the work is, it's easy to translate agathos, and it's an adjective. That's why I crossed out doing, because when you read doing, you think it, there's an action in it. There's no action in an adjective. And so it, what, go, what is there in the Greek is agathos, which is an adjective, and I cross that out. So to do away with doing, does it, it's not, <laughs> I don't know where they got that. And it's talking about good, agathos, work, aragon. Okay? I'm just explaining why I crossed that out. So, to those who by perseverance in doing good work, and it's singular, it's not plural. Work, it's not works. So some of them, I'll show you the New King James Version in just a, so, a moment, and it says deeds instead of deed, but it's singular. To those who by perseverance and in good work seek, and that's a present active participle, I mean they keep on seeking, for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. Would any of you like to get up and explain that? It's not what you think. Here's another version, the New King James Version puts it this way. Who will render to each one 
according to his deeds, that's verse 6 and then verse 7, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Now, doesn't, doesn't it sound like that you'll get re- eternal life those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory? Doesn't it sound like that's necessary to get eternal life? And most people think the eternal life is salvific, which it is not. Okay, we'll get past that. I know it's kind of painful for you, and I'm tr- doing my best to show you. This just shouts out, out at you when you have these different... Um, one reason there's so many different translations because it's not easy. But I'm not, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I can sure, surely say that doing the word in the Greek, I could put it on the logos and actually show you the Greek words, but... It, it, it puts you to sleep, so. I can know that the word agathos is an adjective and it doesn't have anything to do with doing. And when you see the word doing, you think that there's something that you have to do there. It's just saying those who by perseverance in good work seek for glory, honor, and immortality and eternal life. Okay, let's take a few of these words. First of all, we have perseverance is the first word we'll look at, hupomone, H-U-P-O-N-E. It's a noun, a genitive singular feminine. And here's, this is the first, I think the first um, definition is the one that's pertinent. It means the capacity to hold out or to bear up under the face of difficulty, patient endurance, fortitude, steadfastness, and perseverance. That's what that word means. And then we look at perseverance in good work. Just forget about doing. It's not there. <clears throat> and that word is agathos. Notice it's an adjective, genitive, singular, neuter. And it pertains to meeting a high standard of worth and merit. Good. It means good that is intrinsic, meaning essential nature of something has value. Just like gold has intrinsic value. It doesn't matter whether it's on a, a, a wedding ring on a woman's pa- uh, finger or if it's a ring in a, somebody's nose, if it's that gold, or if you find it out in the pig pen that somebody lost their gold ring or something, it's all, all, it has value no matter where you find it. So here's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Dictionary Bible Themes, This is a somewhat of a definition here of good works. Good works acts designed specifically to benefit others which are characteristic of God. He requires and enables his people to do good. Do you get that? Do you understand the importance of that statement? He requires, first of all, for us to do good and enables his people to do good. In other words, he he commands us to do good that he will accept, and he enables us to do it through the Holy Spirit. Although such is contrary to their sinful human nature, salvation does not depend on good works, but leads to them. And I was trying to, I was going to, I would have to take the S off of Leeds. I was going to put a little parenthetical in here because I don't believe, when you read this, salvation does not depend on good works but leads to them. It sounds like they automatically do, but they do not. What I was going to put in there, and just couldn't do it, and without messing up the sentence, it would be, but should lead to them. Because there's a lot of believers that it does not lead to good works. Y'all got my drift there? Okay. Those who persevere in doing the will of God, which includes producing good works, divine good, will receive what God has promised, which is eternal rewards. Now we go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, including good works, 
you may receive what was promised. In other words, another way of saying this is if you do good works, which is the will of God, you're going to receive what was promised because God promises believers who consistently do good work, which is good works, then you're going to receive what was promised. What does he promise for good works? Y'all afraid to shout it out? How about rewards? Huh? That's the incentive, and that's the promise. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Titus 2.7 In all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine and dignified. I'm just putting a few here. I could put 50 here, but I'm just giving a, a sampling. Titus 2.14 That he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession Zealous for good deeds. We are to be, you know what that word zealous is? Spudazo. You remember that word? It's, it's talking about zeal. We should be zealous for good deeds. <clears throat> and that's not against our nature because what are good deeds? It's thinking about and helping other people. And we are selfish by nature. But when we have the Holy Spirit, we're not thinking about ourselves like that. We're thinking about others. Titus chapter 3, verse 8. <clears throat> Titus chapter 3, verse 8. So that those who have believed God may be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. So as we're on this earth, we're going to be reaping, excuse me, sowing and reaping. And if we're out there sowing good deeds, and we should be careful to engage in good deeds, that means careful that we do it, <clears throat> then that is good and profitable for men. This is I found interesting. To be, the, to be put on the dole, Christian widows had to have a reputation for good works. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 10. And the good works, it spells out, and they're, they're, it's a pretty high bar. And so even in the early Christian church, if you, before widows would be, they had no husband in that culture, they didn't go to work, so they needed someone to take care of them, so the church would take care of them, but they had to have been uh, gracious to other people and not lazy and being able to <clears throat> uh, do charitable acts. There's a whole list of things they had to do, good works, before they would be considered qualified in order to receive support from the church. And where it's talking about the women aren't to have braided hair and uh, fancy clothes and all this, it says <clears throat> they are to... Uh, Be mindful of doing good works as well. First Peter chapter 1 verse 7. That the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when we're on this earth, we have the chance to prove our faith. Our faith. See, we're not talking about the faith at salvation. That's already a done deal and it has been accomplished. We're talking about faith in life. And every day we get up, we might feel better one day, not so good the next day. And if we feel better one day, we might be more prone to do something good. <coughs> Excuse me. But it's the faith that God is going to reward us. The faith that this is pleasing to him. That's the faith that's in view here. <clears throat> Excuse me. That the proof of your faith, everyday faith, being that faith that you have in, in doing good works, filled with the Holy Spirit, 
being a vessel that God can use, that is more precious than gold, which is perishable. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't understand how gold could be perishable, but evidently it can. May be found to result in praise and glory and honor. What does that have to do with our verse? Look at our verse. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing a good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Honor and glory, you hear that? That is connected to good works. <clears throat> and it's going to be tested by fire. We are always, we're tested. Are we going to continue to trust on God's provision for us? Or when things get tight and we, we're, we're worried, we're, we're, I'm going to bear hold on to what I have because uh, I, I might lose it. But other people need help. Are you going to forget about them? Or are you going to help them and give sacrificially, even putting yourself at risk to some degree, knowing that God is going to provide for you anyway? Do you see the faith it takes to do good works? And they are tested by fire, but what we want to be found is to result in praise and glory and honor. When is this going to take place? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is talking about what? The rapture. And without faith, you're not going to have any of that. You're just going to, because you don't trust God that He can be able to renew your reserves. If you need reserve food or water, whatever it is, He can do that. If you are trusting in Him to provide for you, when you're doing what He commands us to do, the good deeds, which is to share with others. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. For let him who means to love life and see good days refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. Well, that's about mental attitude sense. And this is, if you want to have if you mean to love life and see good days, if you want to see good days, then control your mouth. That's what this is saying. Because if you don't control your mouth, you're not going to have good days. In fact, you might have to have some dim work on that mouth if you don't keep that mouth under control. Verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. God hears their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Doesn't that sound like what our verse is in 2 7? That those who are seeking, persevere in doing good, good work, are seeking praise, honor, immutability, and eternal life, they are the ones that God is, has his eyes on and his ears attend to their prayer. But now the other side, we hadn't got to verse 8 yet, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And we'll get to verse 8, and it talks about they are self-centered, and they, 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 they're just the opposite of what we see in verse 7. Everybody says, oh, well, that's unbelievers. No, that's believers too. So in red, you see, the ones that do good and those who do evil. Those who do good are going to reap what they sow. Those who do evil are going to reap what they sow. God's going to see to it because he's the judge of all of us. 2 Timothy chapter 20, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 20 through 21. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 through 21. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. In other words, if you are having a big party and people are going to come over, are you going to take your best china and your best glasses and the, whatever you have that are the gold and silver vessels, that's what you put out, but you still have vessels of wood and earthenware. You have other things of every day that you would use that you kind of put aside when you want to put your best foot forward, right? So there's all kind of vessels. Verse 21. Therefore, if a man cleanses himself 
from these things. What is that talking about? Let me, I'll read the rest of the verse. Therefore, if a man cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work, divine good. Now, this is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 through 21. Why don't you go there? I'll wait for you. 2 Timothy 2, verse 20 and 21. Especially 21 says, Therefore, if a man cleans, uh, cleanses himself. <clears throat> In other words, this, this could be saying all of us have our better part of character and all of us have things that we have to deal with, that we're challenged not to be, to be the person that we want to be. And so it's, it's for us, in verse 21, if a man cleans himself. I've got there 1 John 1, 9. Now, I know we don't cleanse ourselves in the same sense that we are able to do that. All we do is acknowledge our sins, and God forgives us of those sins. But we cleanse ourselves in the sense of naming that sin. And when we name that sin, then we're cleansed. That's what this is talking about. And that's why I wanted you to go to 2 Timothy 2.21 and underline where it says, If a man cleanses himself from these things, wrongdoings, sins, that's, I think 1 John 1, nine applies there, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work, which is the divine good. Now what this is telling us, that if you don't do this, if you don't cleanse yourself by acknowledging your sins to God, then what follows is not going to happen. <clears throat> First you cleanse yourself from these things, and you fill with the Holy Spirit, then he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, set apart to God, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And that's to, referring to good, uh, divine good. <clears throat> that just shows that there's different kinds of good. And for a believer, if you're going to do divine good, which you have the capacity to do, or at least the option to do, first of all, you have to clear the decks and make sure that these things in your house that are, it, it even says, earthenware and some honor and some to dishonor. <clears throat> you got to get rid of that part, and you do it if a man cleanses himself. And that's a third class conditional clause. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Then he will be a vessel for honor. And see, we were talking about in. Romans 2.7, that a man who perseveres in good work and seeks honor and uh, glory and honor, that's the first two, and this is what I'm showing you. Those, this is showing you a, a, a verse that complements the glory and honor that is mentioned in verse 7. <clears throat> Okay, we'll run up here for just a second. I, I was on this all day, and I've been on it for a while. And when we, when we're looking at verse 7, these words right here. And I said, okay, I took care of, this is a, an adjective. It's talking about perseverance and good work. And they seek for glory and honor. That I got that. And then it says, and immortality. And I was stumped. Because none of this, from my context that I'm seeing, is salvific. But now we're going to go down to immortality. And this is where, what I, finally, this bothered me the whole time. It was about 20 minutes before I was going to leave to come here. Bam! I found what was the answer to what was challenging me. First of all, immortality, the Greek word is aphasia, A-P-H-T-H-A-R-S-I-A. And phthar, it's, hard, it's hard, hard to say an F and a T-H at the same time. I'm taking the A off. It's phthari, 
exarsia means to decay. Corruption, decay. But aphasia means not decay. You have the alpha negative in front. makes it like un, unrighteous or something like that in English. So, it means the state of not being subject to decay, imperishableness, incorruptibility, immortality, perpetuity, perpetu perpetuity of existence. That's what the Greek word says in the BDAG uh, lexicon. Now, in that sense, you can go to Daniel chapter 12, verse uh, 1 and 2, and 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58, and it is all about salvific. It is about, you, you can't go to heaven in your mortal body because it's corrupt. You have to have immortality. And that relates to what? The eternal salvation. And I thought, well, how's that going to fit in on this? But here is the, what I got out of the Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary. It says incorruptible is an adjective from the 14th century. And it means incapable of corruption as, first of all, not subject to decay or dissolution, which is, I thought, is this the only way that it is used? But the next one says, incapable of being bribed or morally corrupted. Do you see the difference? The first one has to do with what we would say positional, our, our position before God, and the second one has to do with the, our experiential standing before God. And then I found this verse. Titus chapter 2, verse 6 through 7. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. And that incorruptibility is an adjective which comes from the root of sarcia. It's the same word we find in Romans 2, 7. But this is not talking about decay in the, in the, in the ground, because we're talking, if you, if you are in, if you are incorruptible, of, or if you have immortality, then it means you're not going to just turn to worm bait and just decay and then you're gone. You cease to exist. It means ongoing life. Look at the, uh, it means to not being subject to decay, incorruptibility, immortality, per perpetuity of existence. Then I was talking about salvific, right? But this is the other other side. This is the same word only in the version of a verb. So it can mean here's. I'll just bring it together here. So the word immortality, Greek aphtharsia. And its cognates may mean the incorruptibility of the body or incorruptibility of one's character. That was the hardest part for me, and I'm just so thankful that the Lord showed this. You know, I, I found that verse, and it doesn't apply to corruption in the grave. And if, if, see, if you have corruption in the grave, and that's the end of it, then you do not have immortality. But if you don't, I'm talking about the person, we know the body is decayed in the grave, but we're talking the soul and the spirit of a believer. If you're, if the soul and spirit died when your body died, then you would not have immortality. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58, I have that right up here. I, I, I didn't have, I didn't see 1 Corinthians 50, 15, 50 through 58, Daniel chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. You ought to read those when you get home or sometime because it's, it's talking about that those who are gods, who, whose believers will not suffer Corruption in the in the grave. 
He's talking about the person. Oh, death, where is your sting? Why do we fear death? Because God, Jesus Christ conquered death, and even though our body is going to decay in the ground, we are very much alive. Because thanks be to the Lord who gave us the victory over death. And we are, we have an immortal soul. And our body really is immortal in one sense. We know that it decays in the, in, a, in the ground whenever you die, your body starts decomposing. But our body is going to be alive again, isn't it? When we come back with Jesus Christ, we're going to get a resurrected body. And so even for our body, it is not mortal. It is immortal in the sense that it's just going to, uh, we're going to get a resurrection body there. Okay, and then I'm just going to say this, and we'll start here. This is my favorite part. I dealt with every word in that sentence, and I gave you some grammar to show you it can't mean what it looks like on the surface. Doing is given, which is a participle instead of an adjective, in order to make it come out with a preconceived idea, I guess, of what they thought it ought to. Most people think that all this is talking about what we would say salvific, because they think that the ones that are ex explained here in verse 7 are the good ones. They're believers, and so they're going to have eternal life, and they think the eternal life is salvific. This eternal life is not salvific. And this is, if I wish I could have started here, because this is the very best part. Because most of the time when people see the term eternal life, what do they think? Do they, do they think of it? being saved from the lake of fire and you're going to live eternally with Christ? Is that what they think? Or do they think that it has to do with living an abundant life here on earth? Well, you know what they mean. And this doesn't mean what they think. So I'm not even going to give you eternal, I was going to say eternal life, Ionios and Zoe, those two words come together to say eternal life. And... This is so phenomenal because when I tell you that sometimes eternal life is salvific, it is talking about eternity, and sometimes it's not, it's talking about a higher quality of life, an abundant life for believers who are growing in grace and knowledge and they're doing good works filled with the Holy Spirit, that type of thing. That kind of life is some, is called eternal life. And I'm going to show you how you can tell the difference between when you see eternal life from the verse, from the context, whether it's talking about eternal life with eternity or whether it's talking about the superior top form of life. And it's easy to find out. And I'm going to give you 15 verses. I'll give you the very verses in the New Testament that you can turn to that are using the term eternal life. And none of those 15 are not... Are, are salvific. All of them relate to this abundant life that we're going to go over. And much more. <laughs> I guess I, I guess that sounds like a, what do they call it when they would try to, I know when I was a kid and going to Garden Oaks um, Theater, they would always give you a trailer of what's coming next and they would have the woman tied to the to the train track, and the villain is, nah, ha, ha, he's twisting his mustache, and the train is getting closer and closer. Well, you just had to come back next week to see what happened. I guess that's kind of what I'm doing, but I'm just, I, I know what's coming, and it's, it's my favorite part of it. So we'll get there next time. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that your word is so precise. Sometimes it's hard to put aside the superficial meanings that so many people take. It takes, it takes work to dig out the truth and you have to know the language and you have to have context. You have to have the knowledge of theology, systematic theology. And yet when it, when the truth comes through, it speaks to us in the way that you would want it to. 
because we can understand what your plan is. Many words in your in the Bible have dual meanings, and e eternal life is one of them. In order to correctly understand the Bible, we have to be able to know how to make that distinction. And when we can do that, it even becomes more real and more relevant to us, more powerful in motivating us to be good and faithful servants. So we thank you for your word and pray that you will help us to meditate on these things, focus on them so they, that we understand them in a way that they can motivate us all the way to maturity. We thank you for this. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, I am. <laughs> Charlie, you need to stop doing that. You know, you're not a...